Hello and welcome to NewsClick. A recent government survey, the periodic labor force report, paints a rather optimistic picture of India's employment situation. It says that the unemployment rate has fallen in India, thereby indicating a kind of economic recovery after the pandemic. But the report also shows that people are returning to work in farms and agriculture. Now, the agriculture sector is on the whole impoverished and farmers struggle to make ends meet very often. So how are India's farms supporting more people than they would have to in the normal course of things? And how does this increased dependence on farming square off against the claims about lower unemployment? We're going to discuss this with the well-known development economist, Dr. Santosh Mehrotra. He has analyzed India's labor sector for many years and from multiple angles. Thanks very much for joining us, uh, Dr. Mehrotra. Uh, you know, one of the things about the latest report of the PLFS is, is the employment pattern seems to be shifting. We, you know, you and I have discussed this literally over two decades you may not remember but i used to always pester you about from 2004 2005 onwards i tracked that the agriculture sector was getting fewer and fewer people sometimes the decline of employment in agriculture was high sometimes it it was faster but now that trend seems to be reversing or it has reversed can you explain why what does this mean this is a catastrophic development for those people who've been forced to return and it is a very serious uh, reversal of a trajectory of structural change that the economy was undergoing all the way till, I believe, uh, 2015, particularly from uh, the early 2000s. Um, you see, uh, let's, le let's just go back a little bit in time uh, because a characteristic of... Uh, Economic development is structural change. Structural change is, uh, is characterized by a rise in the share of industry and services in, it, in their contribution to output and a rise in their, in their share in their contribution to employment. While the share of agriculture to both output as well as employment drops. Now, Unlike in China, in India, the pace of structural tr change was relatively slow, at least until 2004. So between 1950 and, 19, and 2004, the absolute number of workers in agriculture was always increasing. While the share of workers in agriculture was declining, the absolute number of workers in agriculture was increasing, which is which was highly problematic, which itself is an indicator of slow structural change. Now, because, not, because the growth rate of the economy picked up very significantly between 2004 and 14 to 8% per annum on average, which is unprecedented in the history of post-independence India, that non-farm jobs began to be created at the rate of 7.5 million new non-farm jobs per annum. That actually led to workers being pulled out of agriculture in such large numbers that for the first time in India's post-independence economic history, the absolute number of workers in agriculture began to fall, which is a true sign of structural change. And uh, on average, five, five and a half million workers were leaving agriculture, which had the following effect. One, it led to a tightening of the rural labor market. And as a result of Manrega being introduced in 2005, together with that, we had the following effect, that real wages began to rise in rural areas in the open market, and not just due to Manrega. That had a knock-on effect on real wages in urban areas. Right. So while, uh, while in the last few years of the previous government, the UPA government, inflation rate had gone up, the fact of the matter is that because non-farm jobs were being created at this phenomenal rate of 7.5 million per annum, the real wages continue to increase. In other words, taking into account inflation. And that's ve a very important fact because that is the process that in East Asia, including in China, 
actually uh, resulted in poverty falling uh, on a dramatic scale in East Asia. And for the first time in India's history over that period between 2004 and 14, we can say that the absolute number of poor in India fell. Absolute number. So while the share of poverty in India was always falling, all the way from 73 when we first start, started counting poverty on a consistent basis, it was always falling. The fact of the matter is, is that until 2004-05, the absolute number of poor was still high, just as the absolute number of poor, I mean, in other words, it was high and not falling, and right. just as the absolute number of workers in agriculture was not falling. Right. So the two, two were went together prior to 2004 and actually went together, the two trends uh, went together post-2004 in the sense that poverty fell and workers moved out of agriculture. Now, sorry for this long background to the current situation because what happened after 2015 on account of series of policy mistakes like demonetization followed by a badly designed and badly implemented GST is that you got a uh, uh, growth rate falling uh, after you know 2015 16 right and then when growth rate falls consistently all the way till before covid it falls and this process of people leaving agriculture slows down it doesn't stop meaning absolute number of, of workers in agriculture still declines so from 2004 to to 19 just the year before covid right the absolute number of workers kept falling however right. you rightly observed that 2020 21 2022 and even up till certainly mid 23 for which is the point up to which we have the the plfs data the government data we know that the absolute number of workers uh, increased and increased dramatically so much so that the that it it was a complete reversal of the 15 years of change right. uh, in in agriculture so you i mean it is a what what was a shocking development happened so while in sort of 17 18 the share of agriculture and total employment is 42% in 21 22 it had shot up to 46.5 percent and it has it uh, sorry in 2021 and then it fell slightly but then it rose again in 22 23 yes, so what you have currently recovery year actually the recovery should have strengthened yes so some people would have obviously come out of agriculture in sort of late 2022 or, or rather by early 2022 but then because we we find that non farm jobs were not growing they actually stopped coming out so you you see uh, an increase in the share of agriculture in total employment from 2122 to 2223 okay uh, okay now now all of this is means that this is the river this by itself would be very catastrophic however it goes hand in hand with something else which is very serious which is why i i call this a reversal of structural change so let me just say say that very briefly so that i'll let you ask, uh, ask your next question which is the following you see as i began by saying the meaning of structural change is that the share of of manufacturing increases in total output as well as in employment. And that was certainly happening all the way uh, till uh, from 2004 to 12. However, what we notice, at least in terms of number of workers, however, post 2013, the share of, of uh, manufacturing in, in total workforce begins to fall off. And what is important is, is that it goes hand in hand with the contribution of manufacturing to GDP actually falling also from about 15 onwards, which is really shocking because after, 19, after the 1991 economic reforms, for a 25-year period, the 
the contribution of manufacturing to GDP was in the region of 16 to 17%. It didn't fall below that. Post-2015, believe it or not, despite Make in India, all the talk was about Make in India. But post-2015, the share of manufacturing to GDP in GDP actually falls to from 17 to 15 to 14 to 13 uh, until it sort of begins to revive most recently. And this compounds, compounds the earlier uh, proposition that I've been presenting to you, which is that, uh, that agriculture has seen much more workers. So let me pause there. Yeah, this is this is very interesting and important. Also, because I remember the Krishnamurti Committee Commission was set up uh, in the two thousand early two thousands, and then India's goal uh, given to the committee to basically try and figure out how we'll do this was to take the manufacturing employment from fifteen to twenty five percent, believe it or not. But I think under this government's term for the last ten years, we uh, we've seen a sort of peaks. The peaks are consistently falling uh, now agriculture to manufacturing, but in the middle, we have something called self-employment. And the PLFS uh, report paints a very dark picture on that front. Have we ever uh, sort of seen such a massive rise? I mean, this relates to women working more and more for no pay at all. I, I find that personally upsetting. I'm sure lots of women would be extremely angry to uh, even hear that we recognize this as a job. Um, can you explain why this is happening? Yes. Uh, also, please put it in the context that uh, about a decade ago, this trend had started that the number of women workers was declining. They were studying more is the reason that was given. So now are they going back to, what are they going back to? What are these women likely to be doing? Yeah, I think you hit your, uh, put your finger on, on two very important trends, uh, that of unpaid family labor and how that's associated with, uh, with women. So um, this, uh, the, 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 uh, what I've just been saying about the increase in, in the number of workers in agriculture has gone hand in hand with the fact that workers went back, most of those were males, and also simultaneously you see women who had left the agricultural labor force uh, uh, and were leaving it until 20, 2012 because there was mechanization taking place in agriculture to a much greater extent, not just because young girls, both under 16 as well as, sorry, but under six as well as those between six and 14 were uh, were going to school. So both things were happening on the, on the mechanization side. It led to less educated women who were earlier in agriculture falling out and young girls were going into school, so they were not joining agriculture. So this is also part of that whole process of the decline in the labor force, uh, two, two, two or three uh, processes, which you rightly, uh, which, which you pointed your direction, uh, your, your, your uh, pointed your two. Now, the, the interesting uh, thing you also pointed out, and rightly so, which, which has been interestingly claimed as a great success that there has been jobful growth by government economists. That the, you see, if unpaid family labor increases in the way we define employment in the PLFS, that's counted as employment. Unpaid family labor is still employment. That leads to the labor force participation rate increasing, worker participation rate increasing, and unemployment falling, which is what you've seen in the PLFS right. since 2017-18 and now. And the government claims this as a great success. In fact, it is the exact opposite. Far from being a success, it is the exact opposite. Let me explain that CMIE, which has an internationally compliant, ILO compliant definition of employment versus work, 
does not regard unpaid family labor as employment. And hence, not only is the size of its total labor force smaller and workforce smaller, its unemployment rate is higher, which is why what was making news till about, you know, about 10 days ago, you will recall, was the highest ever open unemployment rate of 10.07 in the economy. Now, that is because they are their definition of employment is compliant with the ILO definition. We continue to use an age-old definition of employment which regards unpaid family labor as employment. Now, I, let me explain to you, but let me give you some numbers on how much has been the increase in the to total number of unpaid workers. Please appreciate the following. Please appreciate the following. I was saying to you earlier that uh, between 2004 and, and, and 14, the absolute number of workers in agriculture was falling. Simultaneously to that, the absolute number of workers in uh, who were called unpaid family labor fell from 100 million in 2004 to 74 million in 2012, which means sort of 10 crore down to 7.4 crore. Right. Okay. In a in a seven eight eight year period, now now notice what happens. Uh, uh, that con number continues to fall all the way to seventeen eighteen, which is what I was saying to you that people are leaving agriculture, and among them are also women. So that number from seventy four million in 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 twelve falls to fifty five million in twenty eighteen. Okay, in other words, seven point four crore drops to five point five crore. Right. After 1718, or up to after 19 in particular, it begins to rise and has not stopped rising. So can you imagine, we are at the following situation. In the last six years that, you know, PLFS has been put out since 1718 to 22, 23, the absolute number of Unpaid family labor has gone up from 55 million to 95 million, a 40 million increase. Is 45, 40 million increase from 55 to 95 million. Is that a sign of distress? D totally a sign of distress because what has happened here, they, I'm talking about rural only now. I'll just tell you the numbers for urban because that same problem is occurring in urban areas as well. And both together are showing up as an increase in labor force participation and in workforce participation. And together, that's showing up as a decline in unemployment. And the government is building the narrative and selling this narrative across the country and the globe, and especially in its election campaigns now, that unemployment is falling. And that's because, oh, there's been a fantastic recovery. So, so this is a false narrative. They are absolutely, literally lying. Uh, and you have a situation where unpaid family labor means essentially that, I mean, following situations can arise in rural areas. That women, uh, and this is particularly true for men, but sorry, for, for, for women, it's not just, but though it's not true only for women, uh, that, you know, fa family farms, which are earlier not being, uh, which were le being left fallow, they are coming in to sort of th that farm is being tilled. Um, may, the man has come back. So some parts of the, of, of the family farm, several, two or three brothers, one was working outside, one was working there. So some part of the family farm was not being farmed. Now the returning husband and the wife begin to, it's not just that. Young girls have rejoined. Young girls have, have joined agriculture and they are among the unpaid family. In the urban areas, you'll find the following phenomenon that earlier uh, the man you, the, the, would run the shop pretty much on his own and had a hired worker. Now, casual work is, that was a casual worker, that that's hired right. worker. That's right. Casual workers, so share of casual workers is dropping. 
unpaid family labor in urban areas has gone up from uh, 7.3 million in 1718 or 1819 to 9.2 million in 22-23. So in other words, that same phenomenon is happening in urban areas as well. So uh, this is a sign of distress and this is this shows up in something else. Let me explain. It shows up that it, because non-farm jobs have stopped growing, regular share of, you see, there are three types of employment in our economy. One is self-employed, of which there are mainly two parts. One is the own account worker and the other is unpaid family labor. And there is an increase in own account worker. So own account worker in the rural areas would consist of that person who comes back and starts tilling his farm. Okay. Okay, so he's the cultivator and he starts tilling his farm. Uh, so these are the two categories, own account worker and unpaid. Or he may be running a little shop or he may be running his, his little craft or whatever. Um, uh, because he could very well have been a potter or something earlier and he comes back to his pottery work. Some, you know, I'm talking about rural areas. Now, uh, so what, what, you, what you get, in fact, is these things showing up in real wages, meaning real wages, which had earlier been growing uh, all the way till 12, had begun to slow down till 17, 18, actually stagnate thereafter in real terms, partly because inflation has gone up and partly because the jobs are not there, therefore nominal wages are not going growing so sharply. Absolutely. Recall... Yeah, right. Recall, compared to this earlier, the real wages had been increasing because non-farm jobs had been growing. I'm talking about 2004 to 14. Right. So, yeah. Let me pause there. Uh, no, no. So, so then what? You know, the agricultural workforce is climbing in numbers. The casual worker is going down. I think even the construction worker is going down, which was the biggest source of employment even in that time when uh, you know people were leaving agriculture one of the critiques of the indian economy at that time used to be that well you know you're creating jobs in construction what's so great about that but now we don't have even that uh, you know uh, growing at the same pace casual is down agriculture is high women are not earning money men are also not earning money so um, how does how does one understand not just the e economic but you see, I, I consider the politicians the best weather veins. Uh, why, why is there so much silence on this? Are people uh, living off the gains that they made in that high growth phase? Is that what is keeping people afloat? Well, my gut feeling is that what's people, what's keeping people afloat is this saving, meaning whatever savings they had, they're running those down because they're in, their wages are not growing up, meaning real wages are not growing. So what you're seeing at the macro level in the, in the statistics is the following, that consumption is not rising. And if consumption is not rising, how are people keeping afloat? They are this saving. So saving as a proportion of GDP has has come down. Right. Household savings is what I'm talking about, particularly. It has come down to about 20, 21% from about 24% or so, household savings. So, and people have borrowed and that's how they're keeping themselves afloat. Uh, so that's really what is what is happening. So. In this context, the narrative that you are hearing about oh, poverty haven't come down to 1%. Uh, and uh, if that was the case, why is the government having to give 80 crore people free rations? It's giving free rations because it doesn't want a backlash in elections. It has created a, a Labharti class among the poorest, particularly those who came back to the villages. And those, I mean, are surviving on the strength of Manrega in rural areas. That's right. Or, or they're surviving on whatever minimum casual wages that are, ca casual work that is available. Because you're, you're right. 
um, casual work is less available. I just want to make a correction on, in respect of construction. You see, okay. Okay. construction jobs, I have to tell you, um, have not fallen off. They've slowed in their increase, but ever since um, uh, ever since uh, 13, they've gradually continued to climb. Uh, so, to, so for instance, in 17, 18, there were 3.8 crore uh, construction jobs. Today, there are 5.6 crore. So okay. That's for males. That's for males. Uh, though I see that that's, uh, that, that, I mean, for, for fe females, there is some increase, but there is not that much of an increase. So actually, okay. so correction is the following. What we noticed was that even post 1718, please remember 1718 was the year of the highest open unemployment rate in 45 years. You probably remember that statistic. Right. Now, what the government then realized was that, you see, because of their NPAs, the banks were not lending to industry and, and to construction sector, etc. Uh, because their NPAs had climbed. So what the, uh, and, and, and they, they're, uh, because of the strict regime put in place by Raghuram Rajan as well as by Urjit Patel, uh, you know, the NPAs got exposed. Now, what, now, government got very worried on account of that because the economy was obviously slowing as a result of the of, of uh, credit slowing down. So what the government did was to tell the banks, uh, because they are public, mostly public sector banks, we are a public sector dominated economy, to lend to NBFCs, non-banking financial companies. NBFCs right. were the ones which lent to construction companies. Please remember that construction companies had seen their inventory rising because consumption had been dropping because of growth falling all the way till 2020. So, so what? So the government came in and said, told, told the banks, you lend to NBFCs, let the NBFCs lend to construction companies. Yes. Okay. So the result of that was that construction companies continued to stay afloat and create create some jobs. However, there was a foundational flaw in this in the design of NBFCs borrowing because NBFCs borrow short when they are lending long to construction sectors for long periods. They are borrowing for short periods. That model collapsed when one or two, you know. I remember the sort of, what was that, D, DHL and then one or two other D, um, uh, NBFCs, they began to collapse. When they collapsed, that crisis again stopped the growth in lending and also slowed down construction. So, you know, the economy has been, has, has undergone multiple shocks mostly on account of economic policy mistakes. And that's how we are where, where we currently are, where the government is having to spin a narrative about low unemployment and high work, you know, uh, growth, when in fact the growth uh, is high only because the economy contracted very severely by 6.6%. More than twice the con con contraction of the global economy during COVID, uh, and that's why the rebound has been faster. And so, it's while it's true that we are we might have grown at six and a half percent, we will grow at about six six point three percent this year. We might have grown faster earlier. We we are slowing down. We are unlikely to continue to grow. But the point is, the world is growing slower. So you know we suddenly become the fastest growing large economy of the world. And we then keep start patting ourselves on the back. The fact of the matter is, if we want to reduce poverty, we want to create jobs in the non-farm sector, we have to grow at nothing short of 8%. And that's where we are not. So our potential is much greater. We are not growing at that rate. And we are certainly not generating the non-farm jobs. That's a very worrying picture you're painting, uh, Dr. Mehrotra, but it's 
can't be helped because it's the government's figures which are telling us what's happening. Uh, thank you very much for joining us and thank you for sharing your insights with us. Before you go, I wanted to also, uh, you know, sort of remind our viewers that recently in another interview at another channel, you you had actually said that the total net unemployment figure in India has grown by roughly three times. Um, you know, can you just explain the source yeah. of this figure? Like, how do we the get source of the yeah, the source of the figure is very straightforward. It is the same uh, national sample, the National Survey Organization of India, which is part of the Ministry of Statistics, which till 2012, which is the which is the uh, data point that I was citing, uh, used to do what was called the Employment Unemployment Survey, and it used to be done every five years. And since then, uh, from 1718, it has started. It is uh, being done every year. So there's an annual survey, and that's called the Periodic Labor Force Survey. And what I estimated was that in 2012, uh, the absolute number of unemployed was 10 million, one crore. And in 1718, which is the year that we know very well as the year which, had, which saw the highest unemployment rate in our country for 45 years, the total unemployed had shot up by three times to 30 million or three crore. Since then, uh, the, the, after 17, you know the growth rate slowed all the way till the beginning of 2020 for nine quarters. Okay. And then we had uh, a national lockdown, very badly designed, very poorly planned, and which imposed... Uh, a national lockdown on a country of 140 million billion people uh, at four hours notice. The result was that the economy came to a standstill. Now that led to more unemployment and we currently ha have added another seven or eight million to the total unemployed. So, and in addition, please note, and in addition, you have the following phenomenon, the, which we have been discussing here that if people are appearing as though they are employed, it's only because of unpaid family labor having gone up by 40 million. Please recall what I, and in rural areas, and if you add the five, four, 5 million in urban areas, that 45 million are unpaid family labor increase alone. Right. You re, if, if you were, if you had an internationally compliant definition of unemployment, you need to add that 45 million as well. Absolutely. So let me let, let me close by giving you uh, what worries me about our country. Our de demographic dividend will run out in another 15 to 17 years before 2040. Okay? And we currently have three groups of people who need non-farm employment. One is, of course, the stock the excess stock which we have in agriculture, which needs to be pulled out, which was true prior to COVID. Right. Meaning, meaning, meaning that you see in nine, 2019 itself, 42% of the total workforce was contributing only 15% to GDP, which is the agriculture's contribution. 42% so, were working in agriculture. Two or three more sentences. And that share has only increased. So you got to pull workers out of agriculture. One, two, the absolute number of stock of unemployed I've already mentioned to you. And third are those who are joining the labor force every year, which is about five to six million per annum who are turning 15, having gotten educated. So three groups who need to be employed. And therefore, we need to generate at least 10 to 12 million new non-farm jobs every year. Thank you very much again, Dr. Merotra.